And let's do some, um, first some introductions. Hello, uh, my name is Melissa Altman. Um, I'm with the uh, preparedness team at the American Red Cross. I'm the regional preparedness manager. And today we're here to talk about general preparedness on simple steps that you can do to make sure that you are better equipped to respond to a, any kind of disaster. Um, so on your screen, you'll see some housekeeping um, items. First, your microphones are muted, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. We want them. So uh, if you could answer, uh, put your, sorry, put your question in the chat and I'll make sure to um, ask it out loud. Don't worry, it is anonymous, so no one will know who you are. Um, also, if you're if on your screen, anything is being blocked, just remember that you can move uh, into a different view. So there's some settings on the black bar with Zoom. Just hit the different setting. We uh, recommend the speakers view. That way it's only one video camera up at, at a time. It does help um, maximize the screen space for the slide. All right. And let's see, a couple more people are still answering, I see. Give it a minute. All right. I'm going to end the poll here and I'm going to show you the results to see what you all think. So the main answer is home fires. And you know what? You are right. Home fires is the most. Um, it kills and injures the most people in the United States every single year. They happen all the time. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but with that, let's get going into the main event. Um, can you go to the next slide, Steve? All right, we're talking general preparedness. These are really the three main tips on how to get going. It's get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. Uh, the speaker today is Steve. If you can go to the next slide. All right, that is Steve. Steve served as the CEO of a tech company he founded and um, led for over 25 years. As a speaker coach, he's helped high school students and Donovan State prison inmates develop speeches for TEDx events. Um, as a Red Cross disaster res responder for over five years, Steve has responded to nearly 120 home fires and other disasters like hurricanes, flood, and wildfires. He has seen firsthand the, the loss, the heartbreak, and all the suffering from home fires. So it's Steve's hope really that today you take at least one of these items home and actually do something. We don't just want people to be learning the information. We want you to actually take action today and make you and your loved ones more safe. Um, so again, it's trying, trying to avoid the tragedy and be better equipped to be resilient and respond to any kind of major disaster. All right, so with that, I'd like to introduce Steve, and Steve, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Melissa. It's always a delight to follow Melissa. You know, when you can get an introduction like that, it makes the whole day worthwhile, I can tell you that. Well, let's go over a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. We got a full slate here. So today, uh, we're gonna be talking about preparing for disasters. And, and as Melissa's already kind of hinted at, our goal is to really encourage you to take at least one step in disaster preparedness. So it's only fair you know, that we share a little bit about what the Red Cross is doing to prepare for disasters. So we'll go into a little bit about the Red Cross and some of our disaster preparation steps. Then we'll dive into things that you can do for your household, your neighborhood, you know, your, your recovery team, however you want to look at that. And there should be time for a Q and A you know, at the end of the session. I, I really like this, this proverb, just because the river is quiet does not mean the crocodiles have left. And you know, isn't that kind of how disaster preparation is? It's a kind of one of these tomorrow, tomorrow sorts of things, you know, where it's on our list. I know I've had things on my list and getting them up to the top of the list and actually do them pretty easy to put it off because we're not really expecting a disaster today, you know, or even tomorrow. So. But nevertheless, we're going to try to get you to move forward and get ready for disaster. So as we get into this, this is a general, prepara general preparation uh, uh, presentation that we're going to do. So it's for disasters in general. The good news is that if you take the steps that we're talking about in this presentation, you're basically more or less ready for most disasters. That said, there are some specific 
uh, things that we need to take into account for various types of disasters. We'll mention a few of those in this presentation, but be on the lookout for our other presentations that are focused on earthquakes and home fires and all kinds of other things, because there are things to take into account that are specific to those. Melissa, it looks like we got another poll here, yeah? We sure do, let's, let's hit it. All right, on your screen in just a minute. Here we go. Which of these disasters are considered the largest threats in Southern California? So select three of the below. And again, these are considered the largest threats. Let's see what you think. All right, we got some answers coming in. Let's see. Ah, we got some smart people here today. <laughs> this is great. A few more seconds here. I see their answers are pouring in. And a couple more seconds. All right, we're gonna end the poll here and I will show you the results. What do you think? Well, there we go. Number one, wildfires. We got earthquakes, landslides, and floods. And you know, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't hardly get any answers for landslides. But this past year, you know, has certainly changed, has changed our perceptions on that you know, to, to where we're seeing that more and more. Nevertheless, you know, what we typically consider to be the top three big disasters for us you know, are earthquakes, wildfires, and floods, but closely, closely associated with wildfires and floods are landslides. So not to diminish that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very inclined to just add that to the list going forward, you know, but that th those are the big ones that we're taking a look at. Now, earlier we asked you the question, what do you think the number one killer is? And and you had that one nailed. So indeed, it is house fires. House fires by far in the United States are the is the largest killer in, in when it comes to disasters. I mean, look at these crazy numbers. You know, a fire every 90 seconds, we have a home fire in the United States someplace. You know, seven people in our country die every day on average from a home fire, 36 people injured. And the National Fire Associate Protection Association says that there is a one in four chance that you and me, all of us are gonna to need to call the fire department at least one time in our lifetime because of a fire that's too big for us to handle ourselves, which generally we're not handling ourselves anyway. So it is definitely by far the big one. So let's move along. So I mentioned that we're gonna talk a little bit, little bit about the Red Cross and what we do at the Red Cross to prepare. It'll be brief, but this will give you an idea. So first of all, what is the purpose of the American Red Cross? And that is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. A lot of people don't realize that 90% of the people involved in the Red Cross are volunteers. So it's largely a volunteer organization. And these are the areas on here that are where, where our primary efforts are directed. Disaster services. Uh, I'm here today as part of the disaster services organization uh, working on preparedness. And we also do response to disasters and other, other items as well. Services to the armed forces. Uh, we, you know, assisting armed forces and their families and the various things that come up uh, through sicknesses and assistance they need. You know, there's uh, the statistic I've seen is about 11, every 11 seconds, we're getting a phone call from a service person or their family who are needing assistance with something. International services, as the name suggests, worldwide disaster preparedness, uh, providing relief, vaccination, reconnecting families separated from war and disaster and so forth, you know, all, and providing international humanitarian law education. Blood donations, the Red Cross provides about 40% of the blood supply in the United States and has, has been a primary provider of blood since World War II. And then finally, community and workplace education. And we're kind of doing that today, but many of you are probably familiar with uh, CPR courses, first aid courses, lifeguard courses, babysitting courses, all kinds of things that the Red Cross provides. Now, locally, uh, we do, to some extent, many of those things, but we're here mainly talking about disasters. And so that's more in, in, in my wheelhouse of disaster services. And our focus is to prevent, prevent prepare for and respond to emergencies. And some of the things that we've done to do that, 
we have hundreds of shelter locations identified you know, throughout our region. And the, the region here in Southern California is five counties, uh, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Imperial. Uh, we have uh, these, these shelter locations look like gymnasiums, schools, community centers, churches, all kinds of places. We have a database that we know how many people could go there for a short time, for a longer time, what kind of facilities there are, and so forth. We also have strategically placed supply trailers that, that have shelter supplies in them so that we can, in fact, stand those shelters up in a timely fashion. We've identified large and small feeding sources. I mean, this I saw this database once, it's just crazy. Uh, we actually have a database that lists all kinds of, of, of food sources, big kitchens as well as small ones. I mean, the Red Cross can tell you the Albertos down on Mission Gorge Road here in San Diego, how many burritos they can make in an hour. I mean, it's actually in our database. And we actually do use that. It's one of the ways that we provide food uh, to, to people who have been displaced. Uh, we have hundreds of trained, uh, trained feeding, sheltering, logistics, and communications volunteers, and many of those volunteers deploy, some of them on a pretty regular basis, and we seem to always have at least some people deployed to disasters out of our region. And that's good for us because there's nothing quite like going to an actual disaster to get a feel for what it's like. And that helps you to perform better when you have to perform, when you have to go through it locally and help our residents locally, then people are already used to some of the chaos that's there and how to handle all that good stuff. We have a number of community preparedness initiatives. Well, one of them is what we're doing here right now, preparedness education and resources that, that we provide. And in the resources category, by the way, there will be a number of things posted in the chat box when we get further into the presentation. Uh, be sure to download them. I think most of them are PDFs and there is going to be that will really help you to continue with your preparedness actions. And then sound the alarm. We'll Melissa is going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, sound the alarm is a, a activity by the Red Cross to help ensure that smoke alarms are put into as many houses as possible, that people know what to do if they're, they have a fire in their home, how to how to escape, you know, how to plan, uh, how, to, how to get through all that stuff. So uh, if you have an opportunity to work with us on a Sound the Alarm uh, campaign, uh, when we did not have COVID times, these are really fun. We go out as a group, large groups, and uh, install it, trailer, mobile home parks and other locations. Uh, but now it's done in a different way. And Melissa is gonna talk about that a little bit uh, later on. Okay, uh, the big one. Okay, uh, we have a poll here. Everybody knows what I mean by the big one because I assume we're all in Southern California. Uh, so the big earthquake, right? And let's take a look at this poll. Let us know what you think. Do you okay. think the big one is going to happen? What does everyone think? All right, it's, the answers are yes, it's going to happen and could be any time. Nothing to be concerned about in my lifetime or nope, not gonna happen. What do we think here? All right. We got about most of the responses so far. Give a couple more seconds here, Steve. All right. All right, let's stop here and I'll share the results with you. What do you think? All right, yeah, man. You know, I've done this presentation quite a few times and I've asked that question a number of times. I don't think I've ever gotten a no. All right, this time we had a couple of folks that said, well, maybe not in my lifetime. Yo, know, maybe you're right, you know, but you know what? It could actually happen before we get done with this presentation. So I hope you're gonna be with us till the end of that, okay? <laughs> so we don't really know when it's gonna happen, but everybody agrees it is going to happen. So, but have you ever thought about where you might be when it happens, where your family members might be, what's going on, what kind of complications there may be? I mean, you could be out late at night in your car with maybe a baby in the back seat and the big one comes and you could be stuck on that freeway. If you considered it, maybe you're at work, of course, these days we're all at home, so we don't have such a big problem, but normally we might be at work, kids might be at school. Do we have any idea how we're going to handle all that? What's going to happen? You know, where people will go and so forth. Have you, have you ever really thought about almost immediately after the big one, things we take for granted that
that we don't have anymore. They're just gone. I mean, let's take a look at, at a list of those things. And it, you could probably add some things to this list. So electricity, gas, gasoline, right? No electricity, no service stations. They can't pump any gasoline. Water and sewage could be disrupted. Communications of all kinds, transportation of all kinds. Emergency services, our first responders are themselves victims. They live here too. So we may not, they may not be available to us. Uh, also, we don't have a way to call them up and they don't have a way to get to us with all the roads in, in disarray and so forth. Medical services, same problems. They're affected and also overwhelmed with whatever, whoever can get to them. We could have flooding and fires, landslides, mudslides, down live power lines, banks and ATMs will be closed. So if we don't have any cash, we're not gonna get it, but it probably won't matter because none of the stores are open anyway. How does that sound? I mean, it's kind of scary when we think about it. And that's why we say the first 72 are up to you. That is, if the thought is that you're right after a big disaster like that, the first responders and the second responders like the Red Cross are gonna be riding in with supplies and everything's gonna be great in, in no time at all. That's just not how it is. And I know a number of you who are on here today are Red Cross volunteers and have probably gone on some of these deployments as I have. You know, to hurricanes and so forth. And it takes time. It takes time just to figure out what's going on. It takes time to get supplies and resources in place. You know, so we really need to make sure that we're going to be okay ourselves. Our families are going to be okay ourselves. That we can maybe work with a neighborhood. You know, this is a time when a village really is needed. So that's what we're here to talk about is how can we make sure we're good for that 72 hours or even up to two weeks. And the good news is that means that we can make a positive difference instead of being part of the problem. Now, one of the items that's gonna be placed in the chat box, and I do suggest strongly that you download that, is this preparedness booklet from the Red Cross. It has pretty much all the information or most of the information that I'm talking about, as well as additional information. We don't have time here to go through all that's in that book. And, uh, and you probably would wanna sit here that long anyway. But, long after I'm gone and you've forgotten all about me, you will have that book. You know, so you can go through that and there are things you can do specifically in there to help guide you through the action. So please do download the book. And with that, what I'm going to do is just go through some highlights, okay? It's just some of the things that you'll see in there and just expand on some of those thoughts a little bit. So one of the things that typically we say is, you know, if you don't do anything else, if you only take one action, you'll let it be this one. Get yourself a kit. So who needs a kit? And who needs to be taken into account when we're putting to, pulling together a kit? Well, every family member. We want to think about the needs of every family member, and that includes our pets. Where do we need them? Well, we need them where we are. Okay, so home, car, if our car is not at work, maybe one at work or wherever we are often at. Remember that scenario with the baby in the back seat in the freeway in the middle of the night? Okay, you know, that's not a great, great situation, but we want to be able to get through that. So that's one of the things we'd be thinking about for our cars. How can I get kits? Well, you, you can buy them. Uh, they're sold at Costco and online, Amazon, all kinds of places sell them. Red Cross sells them as well. Uh, so you can you can buy them, but you know what? Nobody makes a kit that is exactly right for you. So at best, I would say you might want to consider that to be a starter kit and take a look at how you might want to pull to get, uh, together a kit for you. Let me share with you a, lo a little something. So when we were doing all these presentations in person, I, I had a bit of a nightmare, and that was this. You know, I'm been visualizing, I'm out in the parking lot, you know, kind of getting ready to get in the car, putting things away, the projector and all that stuff. And then some, one of the attendees comes up and say, hey, Mr. Preparedness dude, uh, how about show me your kit? And it's like, <clears throat> oops, because just like many of us, it was still working its way up on my to-do list. So I decided, man, I really got to do something about that. So it's been a few years ago now that for Christmas, I made kits for all of our family, that is, I have, I have a, adult children, they have families. I made kits for each of their homes, each of their cars and so forth. And one of the cool things about that is now every year, actually twice a year, I provide refresh, refreshes to that kit. So 
It's a fantastic gift. They, they appreciate it. And it's actually come in handy for them on at least one occasion. So what did I put in the kit? So like I said, it's, you know, every, everybody has a different thing that they might need. So these are what I thought I needed. This is an example of one of the kits that I made for home. And this is, you know, intended to be if we can't shelter at the house, you know, then if we've got to leave the house right away, you know, what's it going to, what do I need to be okay for a few days? And because it's kind of heavy, I used a rolling duffel bag to do that. That's that green bag there. And you can kind of see there's all kinds of stuff there, some dehydrated food, even some cooking things. There's a number of things there and that there's a, a list. This, this slide and this next slide, which is the same thing for a car, okay? In the case of the car, I used a backpack. So if I have to hike out, I can just put on the backpack, you know, and off we go. It's a lot less stuff that I have in the car. It's not gonna last me three days, but it's gonna at least make me okay for a while kind of a thing. Anyway, both of these are, uh, are posted, will be posted in the chat box. So you can download this. And again, this is just an example of what I did. You know, what you would do is gonna be dependent upon what your family needs. Hey Steve, we yeah. have a question in the chat. And the question is how often do you check your kit to refresh it? Uh, twice a year, so about every six months. So I have uh, I have uh, things like Craig bars and stuff like that in there. Uh, and and a lot of those have about a six month uh, life on them. Uh, they're different for different ones. It's just so the, the uh, Craig bars, uh, those, those are the longer, long, some of the longest ones. I buy them at Costco. So about every six months I'm buying, buying uh, those bars and stuff. And then I replace the water once a year. Uh, the water doesn't exactly expire, but especially if it's in the car and, and you know, getting heated up every day, you know, it's uh, the plastic's bound to be leaching. So I replace those at least once a year. Yep. And one, uh, one comment in the chat was, unless you have medication, which needs to be replaced, maybe monthly? Like... Yeah, you know, and, and uh, I think another way of looking at the medication is uh, if I had medications that I needed to take with me. Now, uh, if I have a car kit and it's critical medication, I have it in the car. Yeah, I, I would be a little concerned about that because the heat of a car uh, may actually degrade a medication pretty fast. So I don't know if that would be necessarily something that, that I would do. Uh, and if on the home kit, uh, you know, so what would I do? Uh, you know, I might bring a, a small emergency supply with me if in, a, in my pocket or in a purse or something like that that's not left in the car all the time. Uh, for home, I would probably look at posting, putting a little note on my go kit uh, bag that reminds me of certain things that I don't pack in there that I should grab on the way out the door. And that might include medications, although I could have a small, small cache of medications in a baggie or something uh, with the kit too. So again, you look at adapting things to, you know, to the way that makes the most sense to you. Here's some examples also, of, you know, for unique needs. So it just gives you an idea of some of the things to think about that may apply in your situation, but not necessarily somebody else's situation. Okay, so that was get a kit. Number one, get a kit. So the second section that you're going to be seeing in that in that uh, hand, that book that we'll, that it will be posting is about making a plan. And there's a lot of information about that. I'm just going to again hit a couple of highlights about why some things are in there. So you'll see this business about identifying an emergency team. You know, and, and so who is it that you can reach out to and 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 count on in an emergency? Uh, and you know, let's say that our family gets separated and all that stuff. Uh, naturally, we, we want to have come to an agreement about where we're all going to meet after after a situation like that. Uh, and uh, and also, if we need to relay messages and so forth, if we're not able to touch contact each other directly, you know, one way to do that is to identify some local and out of town contacts. Say, hey, you know, if we can't get a hold of each other, leave messages with Aunt Mabel in Ohio. You know, if, if Uncle Fred and Lakeside's not available or whatever, why do we do that? So I don't know why always, but sometimes in a disaster, the local calls and local communications can be all jammed up if they're not damaged or whatever. And yet sometimes long distance ones go through. So that's the purpose of doing, doing that. Uh, meeting locations, I mean, some of the obvious is, yeah, we'll meet at this house of, of our family. But what if that house is in the area that can't be ac accessible anymore? That's why you want to have a second location, a backup location that everybody knows to go to. 
Uh, shutting off utilities. Uh, some of you may recall that Ridgecrest earthquake, uh, what was it, last year, year before? And, uh, and actually, the kind of the next day on the aftershocks, there was fire and all that stuff. Those are coming from broken propane tanks and gas lines and all that. You know, so you know, when we have, say, an earthquake, we could very easily have broken gas lines, broken water mains, and so forth. And we want to get that stuff turned off as rapidly as possible before we have a much, much bigger problem on our hands. And it's bad enough recovering from an earthquake, let's say, but if your whole house you know, goes up in a ball of flame from gas, I mean, that's just not, not a good situation. So in advance, we want to understand, have as many family members as make sense, you know, who, who can understand where to shut these things off, how to shut them off, and that there's tools reasonably close you know, that we can grab in an emergency to, to turn those things off. Another method of, of relaying, uh, doing reunification, uh, the Red Cross has a website, safeandwell.org. We can register our names there. Any of the websites that we're mentioning in here, by the way, and other things, there's going to be a download in the chat box that will have all those listed, so don't, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, I mentioned neighbors several times. I mean, it, you, you really do want to have your neighbors on board with preparedness if you can possibly do it. I mean, pull together a, a neighborhood watch group or whatever and, and, and invite us to provide a preparedness presentation to them. We're happy to do it. You know, the more your neighbors are ready, then the more it's gonna go better for you as well. You know, so uh, we want everybody around us to be recovering and getting through these disasters. So you might think about who your organizations are, who your associations are, and help to bring them up to speed and let us help you to do that. Now, uh, Melissa mentioned I've been to quite a few fires and seen a lot of sad things as many of us in the Red Cross have. Um, in a home fire, you know, if nobody was, was killed, God forbid, or injured, uh, if the pets are okay and so forth, you know, usually what I hear is some real angst because they realize their ID is gone. So many people, you know, get out with just <laughs> barely what they're wearing. They don't have their wallet. They don't have their purse. They've lost their ID. You know, they lost their credit cards. Then they realize they've lost their photos. Their family photos are gone. They have no way to get them back again. And it is a tough, tough way to start a, a what will probably be a pretty lengthy recovery class. So uh, we can plan in advance to help us to avoid some of those problems, you know, by taking vital documents and, and putting copies of them in a safe deposit box, a, a fire resistant safe, but may I underline the word resistant? Okay, there have been no small number of people who've had items in a fire resistant safe that in fact those items burn. So personally, um, I prefer the scan and backup, put it in the cloud method. I live uh, uh, in a wildfire area. I mean, right in it. I'm surrounded by a nature preserve. And so every year I figure it's gonna be gone. So I consider my home a total burn down situation when that happens. So I want to have everything someplace else but where I can access it. And it's easy to do these days. Google Drive, you can do some things for free. You can load things up. I use a service called Carbonite, but there are many other ones. What that does is it uploads from my computer uh, pretty much real time. So all the files that I have are up in the cloud. I can be on any computer anywhere in the world. As long as I know the access credentials, I can access all those documents. So I scan driver's license and all that stuff and I can at least recover much, much easier. And then insurance. <clears throat> uh, sadly, uh, we often encounter people, mostly renters who do not have insurance, but I've had now four cases where there were homeowners with no insurance. I was stunned the first time I saw it. You know, sometimes it, they just felt like that was a, an expense that they could avoid. Uh, sometimes they didn't even know they should have insurance. And usually this happens when somebody has inherited a home from someone and uh, they never had a mortgage. Nobody ever required them to have insurance. So, uh, but having, ad having insurance is crucial. If you're a renter or a homeowner, it doesn't matter. And watch out for others in your life who may not have that. I was at a home in Georgia after Hurricane Michael and uh, an elderly couple lived there and I was talking to them. I asked about insurance, oh yes. And then one of their adult children took me to the side and said, um, actually their memory is not what it used to be and they forgot to pay the premium. They have no insurance. Their home is gone. I mean, their life has permanently changed. 
you know, so we want to watch out for people to do that. And then make sure we have adequate insurance, especially if we live in a wildfire zone. You know, one, one of the things that many people discovered in Santa Rosa and up in Paradise, you know, uh, to those fires is when a large number of homes get burned up, what would have been an adequate amount of insurance to rebuild had just their home gone is no longer adequate you know, when the whole bunch, when thousands of homes go because all the costs go up dramatically. So you may want to, on your own, don't count on your insurance company to have decided what the right amount of insurance is. Reach out, find out you know, what the rebuild costs are for a home like yours, you know, roughly, and then look at maybe getting a 25% rider or something like that you know, so that you can be okay. And Steve, there yeah. was a, a mention in the chat, it was about um, making sure to not have those important documents in your vehicle uh, because there's break-ins and someone could potentially steal your identity off of the, that important information. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So that uh, safe deposit box is up in the cloud in a secure location, you know, um, in a safe, you know, in the home, but you're quite right. I mean, car theft is prevalent. So, you know, the whole car could be gone and everything in it. So yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, make a home escape plan. Uh, now, I must say, when I first started off in the Red Cross and I heard this, make a home escape plan, I, I thought, you're kidding me. Like, I need a map to get out of my own house. That doesn't make any sense. But now having talked to lots and lots of people who barely got out of their homes alive, you know, and hearing how easily they got, they got disoriented by the smoke, by everything that's going on, the confusion, slamming into walls and coming out with cuts and burns and so forth, you know, this is no, no kidding around. This really is something that we need to take seriously. And it's not that difficult to do, you know, so... Uh, so we want to identify, you know, at least two ways out of every room that has two ways. And, uh, you know, you always got to just cut us off at the pass. Yeah, I know there's usually only one exit from a bathroom and a closet. You know, so if we're unfor unfortunate enough to be in those places, you know, we're not going to have a second way out. You know, we better try to get out as quickly as we can before the fire grows. That's, that's a tough situation or, or seal, seal up the doors and hope the fire department gets to us and so on. But in most rooms, we have two ways to go. But of course, we want to make sure that we can actually get out of the second way. Whoever is in that room knows how to open the window. If there's security bars that they actually do open, you know, that we can get down if it's a second floor. You know, what, you know, how is that going to happen? If somebody's disabled or elderly, who's going to help them? You know, there's a number of things to take into account in our escape plan. And one of the important parts is a meeting place. Let's all get out of the house as rapidly as we can, but we all need to know where we're going to meet. You know, and the, because the problem there is people go and they'll meet someplace, they'll, they'll get out and be in front of the house. They don't see some kids. They don't see somebody else. And the next thing you know, they're tempted to run back in the house. And that's a bad thing to do because that is definitely a way to get killed or badly injured. And meanwhile, the kids were safe. They're in the back of the house. All right. We can avoid this, you know, by by coming up with an escape plan, making sure everybody in the family knows how the escape plan works, where we're going to be. And some families, you'll know, make a game of this. Actually, they'll every six months or whatever, they have the kids go lay down in the beds. So they'll, they'll push the test button on the alarm, and then they'll all go out and meet by the tree or the mailbox or wherever they're going to meet. That's a safe distance from the house, and then celebrate with ice cream. Okay, so it can be a uh, just a regular kind of a party thing. Okay, so we've talked about get a kit, make a plan, and now we're in the third section about be informed, all right? Obtain training, all right? In a, in a big disaster, we never know what skill sets we need, you know, so either us or our neighbors, somebody in our family, you know, things like CPR, first aid, and even ham radio, so we have communications, uh, preparedness like you're doing now, uh, there's a, this is a lengthy list here of, a, of emergency alert stations. These are the primary radio stations in our area that you would tune into to get the most current, most official information. And don't worry about, you might spot yours and jot it down. But again, uh, in the chat box will be a document that lists all these radio stations. Uh, and that would be certainly something to be handy to have should that come up. Uh, register your phone. You know, we, we commonly call it reverse 911, but basically you can register your, your cell phone, your VoIP phone, 
uh, your email address, you know, with with the uh, with the county, and that allows them to notify you of important information in the case and alert that's appropriate for for your situation. Hey, Steve. Yeah. We had a question regarding the last slide. You mentioned about getting um, to a safe distance from um, with with your family. What what is that safe distance? Is the question in the chat. Well, I don't have a, a number in feet or anything, but I, I, I mean, I guess I would probably look to be a, at least 50 or 75 feet away from the structure, you know, uh, ideally. So, um, um, you know, but we want to get out and you know, out, out to out to an area. I mean, let's face it, if the smoke ends up blowing towards us, then maybe that ended up being a little too close. We can always move, you know, but we want to we want to certainly be far enough away that the radiant heat is not blasting us away and that, that we're likely to be safe. So I would imagine it's 50 to 75 and I, I'm not aware of an official number for that. OK, thanks. Steve. OK, sure. OK. So another thing that we want to prepare is to really understand our local disasters. We've talked a little bit about that fire, flood, earthquake, landslides, and the things that we can do with that. And again, we offer various more, more focused presentations that can go into some of those. Uh, for today, I, I'm gonna just dive in, uh, really it's gonna be a pretty shallow dive, but we're gonna touch base on a few things, you know, so that we have some understanding of them. All right, we've touched, we've touched on home fires and it's no wonder that we do. I mean, the number one killer. So it's the most likely uh, disaster that we're going to face or somebody in our family is going to face. So we want to be ready for that. Uh, so <clears throat> here's some things to think about. All right. Number one, up there at top box, working smoke alarms save lives. And that is true. All right. So the numbers are basically homes that have fires that have smoke alarms installed experience half the loss of life as homes that do not have working smoke alarms, all right? So in other words, you cut your, your chances of, of death by 50% in a home fire by having one, you know, by having working smoke alarms, all right? And uh, so that's a big one. Do try to attend one of our home fire focused uh, presentations. We go into a lot of detail in there and it's really good stuff, all right? Uh, basically, when you, you know, we want to, when we have a home fire, we want to get out, stay out, call 911. If you don't remember anything else, that's the three steps, okay? But of course, it's not always quite as simple as that, all right? We want to, you know, we, when we're getting out, we need to try to get out in a safe sort of a way. And that can be a little complicated. Can you imagine you're in your bedroom, the smoke alarm goes off down the hall, let's say, and you wake up, you go over to your door, you put your hand on the doorknob, or the back of the door to see if it's hot. If it's hot, it means you don't want to open that door. There's fire out there. It's gonna, you're not gonna do well, you know, going out there. But you know that you're you have children in another room down the hall. All right. So you're pretty tempted, but you know you can't. That's why you know we talk about an escape plan. So we have an expectation set about what's gonna happen, all right, if that if in this situation, because the kids also know to check the door handle and the back of the door. And they need to be working towards getting towards the window, you know, to get to get out. Okay. So once we have established our safe, as safe as possible path anyway, all right, we want to get down really low because the, the heat from the fire is enormously hotter, just, just even at eye level standing up than it is, say, at knee level. So we want to get down low, crawl as quickly as, as we can, you know, to get out to the exit. If we can't exit, we're stuck in, let's say we're in a hotel room or something and, and we don't have a, a way to get out and the door is in fact to the hall is, it, we can't go out that way. Well, you wanna hang a sheet or a towel or something out there to signal to the fire department that you're in there so that you have a, a higher probability they're gonna be able to find you and get to you. All right, we wanna get out, get to the meeting place, we're gonna call 911 and we don't wanna go back inside. All right, there's a number of really sad stories of people say, realize they didn't have an ID, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, and they run back inside, and that's almost always a, a big mistake. And I just want to mention one thing that we go into in a lot more depth in our home fire thing, and that's this concept of close before you doze, all right? The, the, the bottom line is that you are far less likely to have a fatality 
if the doors are closed when a fire is going on somewhere in your house. The smoke will, is held out by the door. You're more likely to hear the smoke alarm and given when, with, even with the door closed, you're gonna hear it before the smoke uh, descends on you. And uh, uh, in the, in the uh, one of the items that we're gonna put into the chat box, there's a, there's a uh, it, it tells you the name of that and how you can search on YouTube you know, to find that video. Uh, that video being an underwriter's lab video that really shows us dramatically. And I tell you, there's always some people in the family who are resistant to the idea of sleeping with the door closed, but you can really convince them if you watch that video. Okay, so that was just a tidbit about home fires. And now we have a little bit about earthquakes. Again, we have earthquake focused presentation that goes through a lot more depth, but here's some highlights, all right? Uh, what do we do in an earthquake? You used to hear this thing about standing in door frames. There's also stuff about a triangle of life, you know, getting yourself wedged in between furniture and all that stuff. All right, but uh, the, the recommendation now is hold, meaning I want to get down low so I don't get thrown down. I mean, want to get something over me, you know, a sturdy table, you know, a sturdy, uh, you know, something as sturdy as possible over me. I want to hold on to it so it doesn't get shaken away. Now, I know, you know, a lot of times we think, what do you, you know, that, that, that table is not going to stop the building from coming down. That's true. You know, but that's actually not usually what we're concerned about. I'm not saying buildings don't come down in earthquakes, but it's actually pretty rare in California for that to happen because of our building codes. What is far more likely to happen is all kinds of stuff in the ceiling, especially in commercial buildings, start falling out of the ceiling. I mean, lamps and you know uh, other things that are up there, they come crashing down. Most of those are, are not going to be big and heavy enough to bust a table, but they can certainly do us some damage. So that's kind of the reason for that, is to protect us from things that are falling down from above and next to us, like in this other picture here showing a bookcase coming down. By the way, we want to secure the bookcase so that doesn't happen, but that's another story. Okay, whoops. Okay, so if we're outside, we want to stay outside. You know, I know sometimes you know, we're thinking, well, maybe we should run back inside, not, but we, you know, but that transition from inside to outside and outside to inside, that's actually pretty dangerous because there can be bricks falling down, other things falling down, especially right out in front of the building. So we really want to avoid that. So if we're outside, we're going to stay outside, drop down in a clear spot, hopefully away from other things that can fall on us, you know, and just ride it out. If we're in a vehicle, just pull over, stop, set the brake, and just ride it out. You know, that's 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 pretty much all we can do. And if we're in bed, just stay in bed. You want to curl up, kind of like in the infant kind of a position. Pull a pillow over your head to protect your head. You know, and and hold on. All right. And certainly, you know, ideally, the bed's not directly underneath, you know, mirrors and windows and things like that that can break and fall down on you. Okay. We so, got a comment in the uh, chat. Sorry, Steve. All right, great. It says, um, it's hard to tell if there's an earthquake if you're in the freeway and moving fast. So do you think you would feel the earthquake when you're, when you're driving on the freeway? Oh, you're frozen, Steve. Did we lose you? Pardon? Oh, you froze there for a minute, for a second. Oh, okay. My back? My, am I yep, uh, you're back. out? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. When you're driving, you know, the, the, you're, look, you're less likely to detect an earthquake right away. Of course, the worse the earthquake is, the more likely you are to do it. You know, uh, I have actually been driving once in an earthquake, and, and what it seemed like was just something wasn't right. You know, things were... <laughs> I could see things are moving around and all that stuff, but yeah, it, you you may you may not see it quite as quite as quickly as when you are are on terra firma. Uh, that's that's absolutely true. But try to be alert to it, and if you have a doubt, you know, safely pull over to the side to find out what's what's going on. Uh, okay, these are resources some resources for action. Again, you don't need to write these down, but I did want to mention uh, mention them. Uh, these will also be in in one of the handouts in, in the chat box, all of them. So. Uh, you've got, you're going to have that preparedness guide. Do take the time out to go through the guide. There's some really good stuff in there that will crystallize your, your actions and, and bring some things to your attention that you may not be aware of. 
And then these websites, you know, we, we've selected these because they're really good locations. They're really worth, you know, you have a little bit of time one afternoon, morning, whatever, you know, go through and take a quick look and see what's there. So people have put a lot of work in, into some of the information that's there and it's for your benefit. So CAL FIRE, you know, especially if you live in a wildfire area like I do, CAL FIRE has a lot of good information on their site. I really like the Earthquake Country Alliance site. There's a lot of really detailed information in there about, about earthquakes and how they operate and what we need to do and so on. It, it's, it's, it's one of the best I've seen for earthquakes. Uh, Homeland, Homeland Security, ready.gov is basically the, the federal government's uh, prepare, preparedness uh, site is what it boils down to. FEMA is mostly focused on big disasters. You can learn some things about the, their, you know, of what they're doing. And uh, San Diego County of Office of Emergency Services. I mean, that's our local stuff, you know, then, and uh, that's a place to go. If, if we have a, especially if we have something happen and if the web is still up, that would be a good place to go to get information. And of course the Red Cross, you know, so we have both the national address there as well as our Southern California one. Uh, so again, those will all be in one of the handouts that you can download from the chat. And then here's four apps that I think are, are worth looking at. So the Red Cross has something called the emergency app, you know, that can provide you with the alerts as well as information regarding a variety of, of, of emergencies. FEMA, you know, has a, has a very good app, you know, that can provide you with information on major disasters, and the CAL FIRE app, and then the, the county has a great app as well. So uh, you can download those from the App Store or from Google Play, depending upon, you know, what you've got. Uh, let's see, it looks like we have a, a, yet another poll. We sure do. I'm wow. going to put it on your screen right now. This is a question for you. My top preparedness actions are fill in the blank. Now you can choose several of these, but we want to hear from you. Which ones are you going to decide to do today in order to make um, some preparedness actions in your life? So. Let's see your answers come in. And then you can scroll down in that, um, in that screen. And there's gonna be a second question. The second question is, I will compete, complete these actions within either one week at, on at least one action item, um, one month on at least two action items in three months, or I'm hoping to get around to it before disaster strike. So let's see, wow, we got some great responses coming in. Seems a lot of you have been thinking about what actions you're gonna take. So a lot of you are, are, are really pushing to get that kit going. That's great, that's really important. So a lot of answers in the kit. Let's see, a few more seconds to let the last people answer this question. All right. And a couple more seconds. All right, this is so far, Steve, take a look. All right. There are the results there. Wow. Yeah, there we go. So number one is get a kit. And I agree. I mean, we couldn't make, make that any more clear. And I think, you know, it, you can intuitively see why that is, you know, so it makes a lot of sense to focus on getting the kit. So that, that came in number one. Number two was store vital documents and pictures in a safe place. I think that is a great choice. You know, it's it takes a little bit of work. But of course, if you start off with just your most important documents, uh, you know, that's going to really, really help you in the recovery process. And it looks like uh, the third one is, is uh, adequate and working smoke alarms. Absolutely. Cut that, cut that uh, risk in half, you know, for fatalities in your home. And some, and various people have picked everything on the list. So that, that's great. And it looks like, uh, you know, most everybody's looking to do things within a week or, or on the outside of a month, you know, uh, we, we chip away, you know, at these th at these things, and you know, I think a, a good way to do it is you, you you identify the one or two things that you're looking to do first, and don't worry about everything else right away because then it becomes instead of a task, it becomes a project, you know, and projects always get pushed to the back, you know, but if it's a task, you know, and then we have we have a much better shot at doing it, you know, even if all we do initially is order one of the off the shelf kits to get our starter kit going, you know, and then great, we're, we're, we've got a good start. Then we can have another task of what am I gonna do to customize each one of these kits, all right? So we can make it into something that's doable, you know, so we actually do something and that's what's gonna count in the case of, of, a, of this sort of thing. All right, let's 
Let's see here. Oh, and this is the part where I get to turn it back over to the fantastic <laughs> Melissa. Oh, oh, fantastic, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. I, I absolutely love hearing your presentations and you always keep me engaged, even though I've heard them a bunch. I love them, so, so thank you. So yes, hi, um, I'm back to talk about our Sound the Alarm campaign. Um, some of you may already be aware, but our Sound the Alarm is focused on home fires. So many Red Crossers that are on this meeting right now, many of you respond to home fires. They're horrendous. Um, they're always awful to see the other side of people experiencing a home fire. And what this campaign is about is preventing death and injury. It is about having those notifications in those homes as soon as possible so people can wake up and get out quickly so everyone is safe. Um, we'd much rather see everyone survive a home fire than to have any injuries or deaths. So that's why the smoke alarms are a really big thing. Um, they're really important as Steve mentioned, um, but what we're doing this year, it's a little bit different because we can't go into homes right now due to COVID-19. Um, we are partnering with, with fire departments to install um, where we can. Um, some fire departments are actively doing it as we speak, um, but others have decided to wait until things get better. So what we are doing is that education, which is so important. So one of the things is going through the home fire safety checklist. It is a list of the most common reasons that home fires start. Um, it is trying to get people to prevent the start of home fires and hopefully make them more aware of the dangers of uh, home fires so that they are more um, willing to take steps to prevent them. Um, the other part of it is making an escape route. Um, again, Steve mentioned it is so crucial to have everyone in the household be aware of how they're going to get out and where they're going to meet. Um, a lot of people don't think about a window as being an escape um, route out of a home um, if your door is blocked. And I know a lot of um, a lot of conversations I've had with some elderly um, uh, residents, they've been concerned about can they actually get out of a window if it came down to that's their only way out. And these are very real conversations. We need to have people thinking about these options and going through with them to, to take steps in order to think about how to get up. So we get out, excuse me. Uh, so again, our goal is to educate um, 100,000 people nationwide about home fire safety. We're helping create that escape plan for our residents and, um, and recommending they practice their two minute drill. And then again, we're partnering with fire departments to get alarms out there. So, so far we have over 820 lives saved through the Sound the Alarm program. Again, it's just awesome work that um, the volunteers and as well as the fire departments um, do for us. So we're really trying to push everyone to get involved, the, to sign up for that free education or to recommend that education for someone else. You go to soundthealarm.org forward slash SoCal and, or they can call that number on the screen, 619-354-9609. That is where you sign up to get that free education. And then once you go through the education, you can qualify for a free smoke alarm installation once it's safe to do so. All right, next slide, Steve, please. And I wouldn't be a good Red Crosser if I didn't talk about volunteering. So um, I actually started as a volunteer. I am now staff, but I can't tell you how rewarding it has been for me. Um, this, all the experiences at the Red Cross, they are very varied. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities for any type of personality. Um, I, uh, I mentioned the hotshot team, that's uh, the uh, appointment-based alarm installations that go out and install alarms um, prior to COVID. Uh, but we do have blood delivery drivers, we have the local disaster responders, and we also have service to armed forces where people um, get involved in helping our um, service members, even retired or active military and their families. So there is a wide range of opportunities. We have people that crunch numbers and finance behind the scenes. Uh, and we have people that are, you know, responding to home fires on a daily basis. So it's kind of everything in between, but we couldn't do it without our volunteers. And volunteers every day inspire me to be a better person. Uh, and it's really rewarding working with such an amazing team of people. Uh, next slide, please. In order to sign up, this is uh, one way you can do it. So it's the website is redcross.org forward slash volunteer. 
Um, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see Kaylee's information. Uh, Kaylee is one of our recruitment specialists and she can talk you through the different volunteer opportunities that are available, but she can also uh, kind of help you uh, sign up and fill out that application. So we're looking for all great volunteers, join an amazing team. It really is um, an incredible experience and I've really fallen in love with um, the people I work with. So it's very rewarding. All right, next slide, please. This is what we are here for. We want you to start these preparedness actions today. And it, like Steve said, if you chip, chip away at it, it is not overwhelming. So I bought one thing at a time to eventually get my kit. And then I, I practiced testing those smoke alarms. I actually have a reminder on my calendar to check my alarms. But there's little things you can do that make sure you're safe. Uh, we at the Red Cross, we would rather see you prevent these horrible things rather than us be um, on the side with you once they've happened. So please think about taking these steps. The main things are get a kit, make a home fire escape plan and use this preparedness guide. So those are some really great tips that you can do um, to get, get going. And, and before, uh, before you leave, I do wanna ask if all of you could please take a survey. We're really trying to get um, to get better at these and to hear from you. So in the chat box, I'm gonna put a link. This is to a very short survey uh, to ask whether or not you enjoyed the experience and whether or not um, we could make any improvements. So please feel free to fill that out. And with that, I open to questions and I do see there's some in the chat. Uh, so can we get the download for the books as, okay, yes, absolutely. Let me go drop all the books in. Um, so I have them both available um, in English and Spanish. I'm just going to drop the English one in today. But if anyone is um, interested in getting others, um, you can feel free to reach out to me. And let me see. So I'm going to drop also in the um, first, the Home Fire Escape Kits. Give me a second. The chat is minimized. All right. So we have this uh, great ex examples of kits. So you should see that one in your chat box right now. And we also have um, this, the links that Steve mentioned. Those are being dropped in there now. Um, okay, and some people, so I would, um, there's someone mentioned for the uh, earthquake information in Spanish, absolutely. Please just send me an email and I can uh, attach it to you. So again, if you want, uh, copies of this presentation, please send uh, an email to me. And right now I'll type my email into the chat box. So if you could follow up with the um, chat box there. Um, so click on the chat box and you'll see my email. Just shoot me an email if you want any type of specific uh, disaster checklist um, in any language. We have them offered in several different languages. So feel free to reach out to me. And I will be sending the booklet shortly and let's see, another question is, who would you contact to have a presentation made um, to our neighborhood watch? That's me, uh, you're lucky, it's me. Um, reach out to me. Um, I cover the San Diego and Imperial County uh, and um, Kim Offrecht actually covers um, the Northern uh, region. So uh, between the two of us, we'll take care of a presentation for anyone um, in any of those um, counties in our region. So let me see, and then, one request for the future, it'd be great to see the chats people submitted throughout the presentation. Okay, we wanna see each other. All right, that's good. I, thank you for the feedback, I appreciate it. All right, we're gonna get the um, book here in a second. It's, it's for whatever reason, it's not, uh, it's not letting me attach it. So I'm gonna grab it from another, um, here we go. All right, prepare San Diego booklet is now in the chat. You should all see it. And any other questions? All right, people said thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate the support. I just really am grateful. So if there's no other questions, I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here today. Um, and a big round of applause for Steve. Steve, I love your presentations, like I said. So thank you so much for being willing to, to do it here today. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Melissa. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. And uh...
Yes. And, and, and thank you for signing up to take those actions. You're going to yeah. make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. It, ju- it takes all of us. We're all in this together. Again, the first 72 on, are on you. So make sure you and your loved ones are taken care of. Take steps today to make sure that you're going to be more prepared for any type of disaster. All right. Other than the form, I didn't see any other link. Uh, so anyone that wasn't able to get the downloads from the chat, just shoot me an email. So again, I can send you all the ones that I put in here. Um, I do see them in my chat, but maybe, um, oh, you know what? Let me see. Because I think they're, um, when people write me, it goes to a specific name. So I think that's what's happening. It's actually went to a specific person, but not out of everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. All right, now that I've sent the book again to everyone and all right, and I do see everyone's getting it now. All right, good, good. And again, I'll put these uh, back in here. Um, Again, if uh, every time someone writes me, I have to change the name and then someone writes me again and it um, changes to that person, so I apologize. But here, I'm um, sending this one out to the home and car example kits again, in case you didn't get that one. And then I'm doing the useful links again to everyone. So there we go. Now they should be going to everyone. All right. Thank you so, so much. Appreciate your time today. Everyone have a safe and happy weekend. And uh, we'll see you at the next one, hopefully. (laughs) Take care. Bye, everyone.